This project is supported in part by a grant from the Alaska Humanities Forum and the National Endowment for the Humanities, a federal agency. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Iron Rails is also sponsored by the Alaska Learning Network, providing the Alaska Digital Sandbox for Alaska educators and students. Iron Rails is also sponsored by Alieska Pipeline Service Company, a company that has safely operated the Trans-Alaska Pipeline for 35 years. Alieska is proud to sponsor projects that support education and highlight Alaska's history. On July 22, 1900, deep in the remote, rugged Wrangell Mountains, Clarence Warner and Tarantula Jack Smith were exploring the ridge between McCarthy Creek and Kennecott Glacier. A few miles along the ridge, Warner injured his ankle, so the two men decided to rest and eat lunch. As they gazed across the gulch, they spotted what appeared to be a large patch of mountain goat grass. Smith grew thirsty and walked down to the creek where he noticed a green chip of mineral, also known as float. The men headed up the creek noticing more of this mysterious mineral. Their curiosity grew as they came closer to the green patch. When they arrived, they saw not grass, but an immense outcropping of pure copper ore. The size of the discovery made Jack exclaim, My God, it's a bonanza. Little did these two men know at the time that their discovery would ignite a massive railroad project that would forever change the history of the Copper Basin. Advertisement, it went on to say that a thousand men were wanted in Alaska far away. If you ever had experience in handling dirt and rocks, so I played M. G. Haney for 15 common blocks. So there went my blankets, I had them neatly rolled, and I boarded an ocean liner for the land of shining gold. And early, with the shovels on our backs, we started up the hillside to lay those railroad tracks. And in less time to tell you, to tell you it would take, we had graded up the hillside and reached for the Yak Lake. So next came the skaters, they bit before and after. The whales, diamond drillers, bit was enough to drive me daft. They wiggled through my head net and bit right through my jeans. And when it came to eating, they beat me to the beans. So darn to Alaska, darn to railroad work, darn to M.G. Haney and all his beans and pork, for we will go back home to the things we love so well. But will we go back to Cordova? Hmm. As sure as hell we will.
It would be one of the greatest engineering feats of its time. It would challenge the hearts, minds, and determination of thousands of men who'd come from all around the world to build the 197-mile Copper River and Northwestern Railway. This railroad would weave its way through some of the wildest country on earth and stand as a monument to human ingenuity and perseverance, defying the skeptics who said it was impossible to build while enriching business barons beyond their wildest dreams. Their railroad would reshape not only the culture of the Copper Basin, but the course of national politics as well. It's a project that employed 6,000 people and they spent a huge amount of money, $23.5 million in, uh, in 1911 dollars, uh, back when gold was selling for $16 an ounce. It's a huge amount of money. Uh, on a project that was on the same sort of scale as the Alaska Highway or uh, uh, the, the Alaska Pipeline Project or, or the Alaska Railroad, and considerably more difficult to build. Copper River and Northwestern Railway would stretch almost 200 miles, crossing one of Alaska's most powerful rivers, squeezing its way between two massive glaciers, crossing more than 13 rivers and canyons, and snaking its way through some of Alaska's most rugged mountain terrain. Nature would prove to be the toughest adversary that stood in the way of the railroad. From bugs to ice, from avalanches and rock slides to sweltering heat, and temperatures cold enough to shatter hammers, the copper proved to be a formidable foe. From the wet and soggy quicksand of the Copper River Delta to Miles Glacier icebergs, from permafrost to avalanches, two of America's most ingenious men, Michael Haney and Erastus Hawkins, along with nearly 6,000 workers, would battle through some of the harshest conditions known to man in their efforts to tame the Copper River and its country. Just as the engineers would redefine the geography of the Copper River, the railroad would change the political landscape of Alaska for decades to come. This railway would usher in the era of powerful corporations that would strive to exploit and control Alaska's resources which would not only shake up the national political landscape, but push Alaska politics toward the direction of statehood. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869 was seen as a heroic achievement that helped fuel American nationalism. Just as the Civil War unified the North and South, the railroad connected East and West. A stagecoach trip overland used to take six months, but the railroad cut the same trip down to five days. The men who built these railroads believed that American exceptionalism and technology could not only reshape the world, but change it for the better. The accomplishments of these railroad men would help inspire a new generation of engineers and railroad builders who hope to reshape Alaska, the last frontier. Michael J. Haney liked to indulge in drink and cigars, but on the job, he was all business. While he was working on the White Pass Railroad, he met up with a crony from one of Skagway's most notorious outlaws, Soapy Smith. Soapy had earned his nickname Swindling Miners in Colorado. In the late 1890s, he was in Skagway continuing what he did best, separating miners from their money. He sent a gang member up to set a drinking and gambling tent along the trail. Undaunted, Haney told the gang member that if he did not remove his tent from the site, he would blow up a rock ledge directly above it. The gang member thought Haney was bluffing, which was a big mistake. Big Mike didn't bluff. When the appointed time came, Haney kept his promise and the man had just enough time to escape in his long underwear before his tent was smashed by a pile of boulders. Michael James Haney was born in 1864 in Pembroke, Ontario, Canada. As a child, he was bright and energetic, but had little interest in schoolwork. 
At 14, Mike ran away from home to work on the railroads. He earned a reputation as a hard worker. In a few short years, he was recognized as one of the finest track construction foremen in the world. Michael Haney acquired many nicknames over the years. He was known as Big Mike to his railroad crews, and in the financial and social circles, he was called the Irish Prince. But to many, he was simply MJ. Many people looked up to Haney as a brave but stubborn person. Once in Sika, Haney refused to pay a man who claimed Haney owed him money. The man came back later, opened the door, and fired at Haney and his friend. He shot to kill, for evidently both shots were aimed at the heart. A large book in the breast pocket of rice and a bad aim at Haney only prevented the wounds from being fatal. Erastus Corning Hawkins was born September 8th 1860 in South Haven, Long Island, New York. He excelled in math and science in school. At 19, after his father died, he was forced to find a job. He was hired at the engineering firm of Smith & Weston. E.C. Hawkins first went to work on the Long Island Railroad, which was a success, and he later traveled north, where his career would flourish. In Alaska, he met like-minded and tough-minded Mike Haney, and their friendship and careers blossomed. In the spring of 1898, Haney set off for Skagway, which became the launching point for Klondike gold stampeders who were on their way to Dawson where gold had been discovered in 1896. Haney had explored the country on foot and determined that a railroad could be built through White Pass. All that was required was a lot of dynamite, advanced engineering skills, plenty of gumption, and a pile of money. In a stroke of good fortune, Haney returned to the St. James Hotel in Skagway, where he ran across Hawkins. The two struck up a conversation that would lead to a business partnership. Together, Haney, Hawkins, and several thousand men would build a narrow gauge railroad that would stretch to Lake Bennett and later to Whitehorse. Haney and his men battled avalanches, extreme winter conditions, Soapy Smith's wild gang, and politics to achieve their goal. When the Canadians refused to allow the railroad to cross into their territory, Haney sent his 300-pound ambassador to negotiate a settlement using two bottles of whiskey and two boxes of cigars. An agreement was reached shortly after the final bottle of whiskey was finished. Ain't no boundary line there now, Haney's negotiator reported. Aboard the Steamwheeler Australian, a toast was offered to Mike Haney to commemorate his skill and tenacity in achieving the White Pass Railroad. We have camped by mountain and river. We have slept and told yarns together. We have broken bread at his table and roughed it in all sorts of weather. So let us drink to our brother. Good luck and life in clover. Good health and wealth and a loving wife and good rest when life is over. That was a story that I had been told by my grandmother that there was a chief and a group of people going down to the EAC people to visit. They got to the Child's Glacier and there was calving at that time. So they told everyone to be quiet as they went by. And one of the kids decided that he'd find out how, what was wrong if they hit it. And so it made noise, so he hit the drum. And a uh, big chunk of ice came down, flooded out the uh, chief, the boy, and quite a few other people of, of our own people. And we have a song that is in memory of them, of that uh, story. 
the Copper River or the Otna River, as it's known to the original inhabitants of the Copper Basin, flows through some of the most beautiful and spectacular country in Alaska. It starts high in the Wrangell Mountains as a stream trickling off Copper Glacier, and it quickly grows into a powerful, turbulent force fueled by the 13 main tributaries along its nearly 300 mile route to the Pacific Ocean. One of the most terrifying parts of the Copper River is the 200-yard stretch known as Abercrombie Rapids. This is where the river drops suddenly and forms standing waves up to 15 feet tall that could overturn a boat instantly. This section alone has turned around countless exploration missions and has claimed many lives. The Copper was everything that ornery rivers are noted for, and then some, one observer stated, Besides icebergs, rapids, and shifting sandbars, there is the Copper River Blast. River legend holds that the force of this wind was so great that when the railroad was running, a chain was fastened to the entrance of the Flag Point Bridge, and if the chain stuck straight out in the wind, the trains didn't cross. These winds and other weather conditions played a vital role in the Copper River. In the winter, Snow drifts of up to 100 feet form, making the thought of building a route of any kind through this country seem outlandish. These were just some of the harsh conditions with which the Atna and early explorers of the Copper River, such as William Abercrombie and Henry Allen, had to contend. Never have I seen Indians more devoid of luxuries than are the Atnas. The wealthiest count only the following vessels and utensils in their department. One to three large kettles, one tea kettle, one frying pan, several wooden trays, several knives, generally home manufactured, horn spoons, and two or three cups. The Copper River was important to the Atna people for subsistence and as a highway to the ocean. They traveled to the coast to trade copper with Eyak for furs and goods. Even though the Russians established a trading post near Tural during the mid-1800s, the Atna were virtually excluded from trade with the outside world. But life for the Atna would slowly start to change in the 1800s when a new type of explorer entered the region. The United States purchased Alaska from Russia in 1867. When the United States came to Alaska, Little was known about the interior. Beginning in the mid-1880s, famous Indian fighter General Nelson A. Miles ordered a series of expeditions in Alaska to gain a sense of the temperament of the native people. In June of 1884, Lieutenant William Abercrombie became the first American military man to attempt to ascend the Copper. His plan was to explore the Copper and Tanana River valleys, the party began by towing their small boats upstream, but soon realized the cold iron grip of the Copper River was almost impossible to overcome. The water had now grown so cold it was impossible to make any headway against it. 
Wading deeper than midway between the knees and trunk, one would be paralyzed after submersion for even 15 or 20 minutes. So that all draft power was gone for a time, forcing the men to let go of the tow line and run themselves up and down the bank just to warm themselves. Abercrombie made it as far as Miles and Childs glaciers before he turned back. Only 30 miles upstream from the mouth of the Copper River, he returned home in defeat. Lieutenant Henry Allen set out to succeed where Lieutenant Abercrombie failed. Like Abercrombie, Allen's mission was to explore and map the Copper and Tanana River valleys. His team included native guides, along with Sergeant Caddy Robertson and Private Fred Fickett. Allen left much earlier, in the spring of 1885. His plan was to ascend the Copper using sleds when it was still covered in ice. Yet still he had to undergo extreme hardship as he and his men traveled up river. The snow on the river 17 miles above Abercrombie Canyons was four and a half feet deep. The sun during the day melted the snow considerably and as it began to freeze again, it would clog the snowshoes. Some of our sleds did not reach camp until midnight and so exhausted were the men drawing them that they were outstretched on the snow several times within just a few hundred yards of our camp. The Allen expedition reached Toral at the confluence of the Copper and Chitna rivers in only 20 days. At Toral, Allen decided to explore the Chitna, where he had heard there were sizable copper deposits. Allen had seen pieces of pure copper that the Atna used in their bullets and weapons. He spent three weeks exploring this tributary. Afterward, Chief Nikolai and three other Atna accompanied him up the Copper River to the Taslina River where Allen then continued on his trek through the Alaskan interior, down the Yukon and up the Koyukuk on a journey of some 1,500 miles. In 1898, thousands of miners came into the Copper Basin, fooled by a media hoax that promoted the Copper Basin as a gold seeker's paradise. These stampeders spent grueling days climbing and descending the Valdez and Clutina glaciers, and whipsawing lumber for rickety boats that they used to descend the Clutina River. When they reached the Copper River, below modern day Copper Center, most left, yet many spread out through the country looking for mineral wealth. Reuben McClellan led one group of prospectors that formed the Chitna Company. This group explored the Chitna River in search of copper deposits. In the winter of 1899, the McClellan party arrived in Toral and met up with Chief Nikolai. His people were desperate for food since much of the game had been driven out by the thousands of Stampeders who flocked to the region. Nikolai agreed to trade the location of his copper deposit for a food cache that the McClellan party had stashed. The Nikolai claims were staked in July of 1899. On inspection of the claims, McClellan found what he thought was a good deposit. While the deposit looked good on the surface, it didn't really go anywhere and never produced any copper. The prospectors later fanned out across the mountains near present-day Kennecott, which led to the discovery by Tarantula Jack Smith and Clarence Warner. What the McClellan party needed next was someone who could help turn the remote claim into a profitable enterprise. Mr. Birch, I got a mountain of copper up there. There's so much of this stuff sticking out of the ground that it looks like a sheep pasture in Ireland when the sun's shining at its best. Birch was the quintessential turn of the century entrepreneurial. He was a, he was a guy who, who was from a good family but, but didn't have any money. Uh, they had good family connections and good breeding and, uh, and he was educated but, but the family didn't have any money. His connections 
were largely responsible for him getting a job as a scout with Abercrombie, or completely, I mean, because he wasn't qualified for the job at all. Stephen Birch was 10 years old when his father, a wounded Civil War sergeant, died. His mother moved him and his five siblings to Mawa, New Jersey, where they met the Havemeyers. The Havemeyers took a special liking to Stephen and bankrolled his education. The Havemeyers used their connection to get Stephen appointed to a later Abercrombie expedition as a guide. This gave the ambitious young man the chance to learn the land and scope out investment opportunities. The McClellan party lacked financial power to develop the mine alone and needed more money to support the development. Stephen Birch met Smith and Valdez and he vowed to check out the copper claims when the winter ended. Birch was the right man, in the right place, at the right time, with the right connections. After talking to Smith about the mining prospects, Birch returned the following spring to investigate the load and saw it had great potential. He immediately started buying up the Chitna Company claims for around $25,000 a piece. Stephen returned the following summer with workers and enough equipment to start digging into the ore deposits. Mining journals would later proclaim that the Kennecott deposits were the richest ever discovered, with ore that would assay between 13 and 25 percent. Birch knew that transporting the ore to Tidewater would require a railroad, and for that enterprise, he would need more financial support. Daniel Guggenheim had a worldwide network of eyes and ears. He was searching for mining opportunities to expand the Guggenheim Empire. Daniel came from a family of 12 sons that focused on hard work. They lived by three main working principles. One, always go in for big development when the business barometer is low. And two, always use cheap labor and raw materials from undeveloped countries to depress your own country's industries, to force its wages and its prices down so cheap that you can afford to buy them up and sow into your own monopoly. And three, there's no use in competing unless you own everything from mine mouth to finished product. Daniel Guggenheim met Stephen Birch, and when the subject of a railroad from Valdez to the mine came into the picture, Guggenheim knew that he would not be able to finance it alone. So he sought help from J.P. Morgan, who is perhaps the most powerful financer in the United States. Morgan knew that across the U.S. the demand for copper was going up. Copper wiring was used for electricity, and by adding copper to the steel made railroad rails stronger and capable of handling heavier and faster trains. After assessing the deal, Morgan agreed to fund the railroad. The syndicate was born, and by 1905 it had consolidated nearly all the major mining claims in South Central Alaska, and even purchased the Alaska Steamship Company, which allowed it to control the region's transportation. The biggest challenge for the syndicate was figuring out how to transport the copper ore to the coast, where it could then be shipped to smelters in Tacoma, Washington. Four routes were considered contenders. Each had its advantages and its drawbacks. The Toncina route would start in Valdez and wind its way up to Thompson Pass, onto the Tico River Pass, to the Ernestine Divide, all the way to the Toncina River and up to Kennecott. The proposed Desnuna route would also start in Valdez. It would then climb through Marshall Pass and descend to the Copper River and then run parallel along the Chitna River to the mine. The proposed Orca route would start in Cordova. Cordova was protected by a long bay. Unlike the two Valdez options, this route had a relatively low grade it would require two major bridges to swing past Childs Glacier. It would then pass Abercrombie Rapids and onto the mine. 
The fourth proposal was the Catala route. Catala did not have a natural breakwater like Cordova did, but the grades were not as steep as the Valdez route. The biggest benefit of the Catala route was its proximity to the Bering coal fields, which would provide an inexpensive fuel for the railroad engines. Syndicate engineers settled on the Catala route. While the syndicate was starting construction in Catala, Michael Haney was in Cordova planning a gamble of a lifetime. Haney listened to the prophecies of all these self-proclaimed so-called engineers smiled and went about his colossal task. He had long since stopped, looked, and listened at the threshold of this dreaded monster's forbidding domain before making a final decision. And as battle lines were well drawn, he was confident of success. F.B. Whiting. At a time when choosing the right route was imperative, a master gambler was preparing his next move. Or, his next bluff. Haney's plan was to start at Ia, later named Cordova. The railway would traverse the vast Copper River Delta, snake its way between two massive glaciers, chisel its way past the rugged mountains surrounding Abercrombie Rapids and Woods Canyon, and cross more rivers than anyone dared to count. Even though Haney knew that he could not afford the expense of constructing the entire railway, he took a gamble and began to work on his Cordova route, hoping the syndicate would buy him out. A huge gamble, but one that Haney relished as he walked a fine line between failure and fortune. When I came back from fishing in the fall, what should meet my eyes but a full-fledged city? One fisherman noted, in a matter of months, Cordova grew from approximately 200 to 5,000 people. When I reached Cordova, the town was all on the flat at the foot of Viac Lake, where the roundhouse was being built. The only signs of businesses, besides the road camp, were a couple of canneries and four saloons. Cordova offered a good natural harbor and plenty of level ground for construction. As the Copper River and Northwestern Railway started, it offered an abundance of jobs. At this time, the town quickly grew from a small subsistence village to a large developed town with over 5,000 workers and prospectors. With the rise of workers came buildings. One of the first businesses to open its doors was the Northwestern Saloon. Soon after, the clubhouse opened, which later became known as the Red Dragon. The Red Dragon served many purposes and offered a comfortable place to read, play cards, or simply relax. While Haney was beginning work in Cordova in the spring of 1906, the Morgan Guggenheim Syndicate would suffer a series of political and engineering setbacks. President Theodore Roosevelt, America's trust-busting president, shut down the Bering River coal fields, forcing the syndicate to import coal from Canada to run its Catala route. To compound the syndicate's political misfortune, a fall storm in 1907 destroyed the Catala breakwater that had cost more than $2 million to complete. Haney had once said that Catala was a killer, and his prophecy proved true. Power banker J.P. Morgan was not amused when he heard the news. Whatever the route, we've got to bring that copper and coal together. The syndicate struggled to find a new route to the copper mine. They ordered E.C. Hawkins to consider all possible routes. Hawkins concluded that Haney's route from Cordova was the most practical. Haney's gamble had paid off. He sold this right away to the syndicate and was then hired as the chief contractor. Big Mike was on the job again. Railroad construction in other parts of the state created a demand for workers. While Haney was away, his crew was threatening to go work in Seward with the Alaska Central Railway. Haney's physician, Dr. Whiting, conjured up an unusual solution. He rubbed croton oil on one of his patients, 
which caused a rash that resembled a case of smallpox. An emergency was declared, the town was quarantined, and no railroad workers could leave. Trouble was brewing between the residents of Valdez and Alaska Syndicate workers over a railroad right-of-way through narrow Keystone Canyon. Valdez residents hoped to reap the financial windfall that would come their way if their home railway plan could be realized. The problem was that the Syndicate had claims to the same route, and the disagreement reached a flashpoint in September 1907. Many Valdez residents supported the railroad, convinced it would mean a financial windfall for their town. The syndicate had begun to construct a railroad line from Valdez to the interior, but by 1906 they abandoned their plans. This devastated the hopes of the people in Valdez. A new booster, Henry Durr Reynolds, stepped forward. Reynolds was 35 years old and was described as tall, slender, eloquent, persuasive, energetic, volcanic-spirited, and optimistic beyond belief. He inspired hope with his big plans for the Valdez region. Here comes Reynolds and he says, look, I've been looking this over and I know we can do it. It would be the home railway, we Alaskans to do it. We don't need outsiders to do it. We don't need big Eastern money to do it. We can do it, and I can get financing for you. I've gotten financing for all these mines. Come take a trip out and see what I've done in this mine on Lotush Island. And he took practically most of the town out. Reynolds convinced town boosters and even Alaska's territorial governor, John G. Brady, to help bankroll a home railway. The prospector, Valdez's leading newspaper, proclaimed Reynolds to be the Moses to lead Valdezians out of the slumbering commercial wilderness. He obviously was a man with a lot of charisma, um, a great salesmanship. When he came to Alaska, he had came up because he had bought a mine. And when he got here, he found that there were buildings and no mine. And instead of being upset about it, he said, OK, if I got snookered, there are going to be others. Ordinary Valdez citizens brought their own picks and shovels to start work on the railway. By July of 1907, the Alaska Home Railway was slowly moving towards Keystone Canyon. Even though the syndicate had lost interest in its Valdez route, it was still interested in protecting its right-of-way through Keystone Canyon. The dispute reached a fever pitch on September 25, 1907. In the early morning, 200 workers from the Alaska Home Railway arrived in Keystone Canyon. They were convinced that the syndicate's claim to the Keystone right-of-way was invalid. Billy Kish was a syndicate worker on location in Keystone Canyon. On the night of the 19th, I was on watch out there. I saw three or four men coming along, and pretty soon I see another, another four or five coming. Another 15 minutes go by, there's 10 or 12 men coming right around here. Yeah, well, it all, it all looked so suspicious so early in the morning. So I, I went and I woke up John Biggs and I told him, told him something was going on, something was wrong. He comes up to me and he says, well, rouse the camp. Meanwhile, some of Reynolds' home railway men were ready to push the issue. The only way to get any money or anything is to jump this cut and just take possession of it. The home railroad men marched to the barricade, carrying stones, clubs, and pick handles. As the men marched, Marshal Ed Hasey ordered them to stop. Hasey was suddenly besieged by approaching men. He fired into the air, but the mob continued to advance, cursing and shouting and waving rocks, clubs, and trees. Hasey shot at their feet, wounding six, with one later dying from his wounds.
Ambulance cars rushed the wounded to Valdez. The shootout caused a political storm in Valdez. Hasey was charged with murder, and many blamed the strong arm tactics of the Morgan Guggenheim Syndicate for causing the bloodshed. The Valdez newspapers and telegraph service were both controlled by Reynolds backers. The initial report sent out from Valdez claimed that a group of innocent workmen had been ambushed by the Guggenheim forces. No train would ever reach the summit of Thompson Pass. The Alaska Home Railroad was finished on October 10, 1907. Reynolds' career was over. Through a series of financial mishaps, he lost his backing, which had a devastating impact on the economics in Valdez, as hundreds of workers wandered the streets with useless home railway checks. Governor Brady, a one-time supporter of Reynolds, was a broken man and was quickly relieved from his office. Reynolds moved back east and was later arrested for mail fraud. He was found to be insane and spent the rest of his life in a New York asylum. Once the syndicate settled on Haney's Cordova route, railroad construction pushed ahead with full force and determination. The logistical obstacles would be immense. Nearly 100 bridges and trestles would have to be built to complete this route. Haney and Hawkins planned their attack with the same determination they had grown accustomed to when they had worked together on the White Pass Railroad. The Copper River and Northwestern Railway would require more than 100 bridges and trestles covering 15% of its 197 miles. Big Mike Haney would be responsible for all railway work except for the steel bridges. These would be built by E.C. Hawkins and the Catala Company. The men were hard pressed by the Railroad Act of 1898 that required all railroad construction to be completed within four years of the final survey. As always, bringing in the right kind of men to tackle this work was essential. A station man is a hard rock man, a rough and ready construction man of the old school. Hard drinking, hard working, swearing, snoo spitting, he will tackle any job, no matter how tough. Most of the station men were Scandinavians, and they had some colorful names. Sometimes he worked with a man for years and never knew his real name. There were such handles as Picklehand Jones, the Norwegian King, shoot him up Swede, crooked Swede, hurry up Jones, and the like. There was a great deal of latitude in the matter of names. The men were of assorted nationalities, some with exceedingly unpronounceable names. If a Mr. Mikslovoposky applied for work, the paymaster would fix a firm eye on him and pronounce, from now on, your name is Jack Robbins. That was that. From that day on, he was Jack Robbins, and off he went to work, sometimes very confused. The company simply put an ad in one of the Seattle papers saying that anyone who wanted to work on a railway in Alaska and had $15 for steerage fare to Cordova would get the proper consideration. When I got to Cordova, they gave me a pick and shovel and pointed in the direction of Kennecott and said, Dig! Well, I wrought mightily for a while, but I guess at times I straightened up and gazed sort of wistfully in the direction of the mines. They could see I was a born leader, so they made me an ax man who went ahead of the construction survey and layout of the route. I was to dash ahead, cutting down brush, trees, and devil's club. The railroad crews followed the old native trail from Eak to Lagnik, installing small bridges and culverts, sometimes as many as 40 a mile as they went along the soggy tundra and quicksand. 
crossing hundreds of glacier-fed streams. This was also prime country for Alaska's famous insects. There's the little gnat who makes for your forehead, the little gray fly whose specialty is the ears and nose, the red fly, general practitioner, who operates wherever there is an opening visible. Tobacco smoke does not seem to seriously bother Alaska's canary birds. In fact, I have many times watched a row of them perched on the rim of my pipe. Haney's men battled conditions that seemed insurmountable. A work train carrying 160 men stopped after it encountered a snowdrift that even the rotary snowplow could not cut through. Within minutes, the train was completely covered with snow. The men dug themselves out of the cars and began to shovel. It took them 21 days to dig the train out from under the snow. Luckily, the train contained food, cook stoves, and blankets. Later, a glacial lake broke and spread water and ice over 20 miles of track, tearing out trestles and embankments. The railroad ties were made from coastal hemlock, and 70-pound steel was used for the first 131 miles of rails. The first major bridge was at Flag Point at mile 27. Flag Point required two spans of 700 feet and 600 feet long to cross the individual branches of the river's wide delta. Construction was hampered by winds ranging from 60 to 95 miles per hour. A chain was fastened near the start of the bridge. If it flew vertical, it was not safe for the train to cross the bridge. When the Flag Point Bridge was completed, it was hailed as crossing the Rubicon. M.J. Haney has crossed the Copper River with his iron horses and is now laying track on the island. <laughs> Somebody doesn't head him off down at the coal fields, he'll scare old Juno to death by running an engine into the place sometime in the near future. Besides the elements, some of the dangers the men faced were of the natural variety. E.C. Hawkins' son, Mason, had to walk eight miles through the tundra to reach his work site. The camp cook was so afraid of bears that he nailed cleats on a tree beside his tent to help him make a quick getaway if the situation required it. One night, Mason was walking along the railroad. He tumbled into a deep hole and landed on something very soft. He grabbed firmly and soon realized he was on top of a bear. Mason ran one direction and the bear the other. The men worked for $3.50 for a 10 hour day when $1.75 was considered a fair wage in the lower 48. Interestingly, horses were paid the same rate as men. The task of constructing a bridge between the Miles and Childs glaciers was one of the most formidable obstacles considered when building the railway. The bridge would span a quarter of a mile and cost approximately $1.4 million, christening it the Million Dollar Bridge. Apart from being extremely costly, assembling the bridge was a complex and dangerous task that was challenged by icebergs calving from Miles Glacier, shifting sandbars, winds up to 90 miles an hour, and relentless winter conditions. The Miles was bigger than all of the glaciers in Switzerland combined, and it produced icebergs up to 50 by 100 feet, which traveled downstream at seven miles an hour. The million dollar bridge would have to withstand the flotilla of icebergs calving from the Miles. The engineers decided that the bridge to thread between Miles and Childs glaciers would be a steel cantilever bridge supported by three concrete piers. It would have four spans varying in length from 300 feet to 450 feet and would take two years to build. 
The bridge would also have to be built high enough to allow Miles Glacier icebergs to pass beneath it. Large icebreakers would also have to be sunk and planted upstream of the exposed piers. The first step of the bridge's construction required the building and sinking of caissons, hexagonally shaped airtight chambers. These caissons were driven 36 feet below the riverbed to bedrock. Men, known as sand hogs, chipped away at the river bottom, enduring dark, cold, and wet conditions. Cement was poured into each caisson, which would then hold the piers. After the piers were built, a rudimentary footbridge, or catwalk, was strung across the expanse. Crossing it was a hair-raising experience. Lots of men walked across the catwalk all the time, but I only got on it once. I swore I'd never get on it again. You were just out there with the wind and the help of God. When winter came, a cable was stretched across the river that pulled scows loaded with supplies, powered by a donkey engine, to help supply railway workers further up the line. During the summer, the sternwheeler Golkana, fitted with a steel hole, also moved supplies, men, and equipment up the line as far as Miles Lake. The spans connecting the concrete piers were constructed in place by using intricate false work on the thick ice. The first two spans of the bridge were completed with minimal trouble, but by the third span the situation changed. Sudden warm temperatures increased the activity at Miles Glacier, which caused the ice embracing the base of the false work to shift, which threatened to unseat the third span. Workers used engine steam to melt away ice from the piles and block and tackle to drag the bridge back into place. Well, gentlemen, there isn't much to say, but more to see, as you will readily observe. I have called you into this conference upon a matter which means much to me, as well as yourselves. The fate of this undertaking now hangs by a hair, as does also my reputation as a bridge builder. I informed you two years ago that this was possible, contrary to the opinions of noted experts, and that opinion still holds good. And if the goddess of fate will allow me one hour more, that is all I ask. Workers were able to secure the third span one hour before the false work shifted for good. The fourth span, passing over relatively calm and shallow water, was finished a month later. To minimize the completion time of the railroad, progress past the million dollar bridge continued at full force. Even after the construction of the million dollar bridge was completed, Child's Glacier would still have the last word. During the summer of 1910, the glacier began to advance toward the million dollar bridge. In August, it surged eight feet per day. Many thought the bridge was doomed, but the glacier eventually receded. The Copper River and its glaciers yielded to the engineers in the million dollar bridge. E.C. Hawkins praised the persistent efforts of the workers that constructed the Million Dollar Bridge. They were at work at 7 in the morning, in every kind of weather. And there was no stopping until noon. When the whistle sounded, they were off for the mess house, like an army of squirrels. A few minutes later, they were racing back to the work, just as fast as they had left it. They kept at work until 11 o'clock, and often midnight, when it seemed that flesh and blood could stand no more. It was the most amazing exhibition of loyalty, efficiency, and endurance that I have ever known. Hawkins later retold a story about one worker's dedication to the job. The worker had broken several toes and was taken away to the hospital. The next morning, the man was nowhere to be found. When the work whistle blew, he was discovered on the highest steelwork. Neither threats nor orders from his superiors could force the man to leave his job. Work continued on the railway farther upriver. Construction above Abercrombie Rapids was aided by the steamer Chitna, which was assembled on the Copper River in 1907. 
Since Abercrombie Rapids blocked the steamer's ascent of the Copper River, the steamer was disassembled and packed by sled over Marshall Pass and down the Tasnuna River during the winter. A 14-man crew and 12 horses plowed the trail. When the boat was launched on July 1st, the daughter of Chief Goodlatah, a respected Atna leader, christened the Chitna. Other boats were put into service on the Copper. They carried provisions and supplies. Just a few miles past the Million Dollar Bridge lay a precarious, almost vertical wall of rock suspended over a dangerously swift torrent of water. Construction through Abercrombie Canyon required heavy rock work along the sides of cliffs. Six snowsheds had to be built along the mile 49 to mile 56 section to protect the railway from avalanches. Railroad workers laid tracks across the five and a half mile tongue of the Allen Glacier and the moraine of the Grinnell Glacier. In addition to the bridges and trestles, some nine tunnels varying in length from 350 feet to 800 feet would be required to complete the railway to just beyond Chitna. At mile 89, workers slowly bore their way through a rock wall. In order to move things along, Michael Haney placed a case of whiskey in the bushes at the far end of the rock where the tunnel entrance would emerge. He told the men that the whiskey was theirs as soon as the tunnel was finished. Legend has it that the men bore through the rock in record time. If a man went in to work too soon after blasting, it was occasionally necessary to drag him out dead. The rugged, hazardous, and bone-chilling conditions required a special kind of worker. E.C. Hawkins insisted on the best possible accommodations and medical facilities for the 6,000 railroad workers. More than seven hospitals were spread along the route, which helped keep morale and labor problems to a minimum. During the winter of 1909 to 1910, our party was camped in our tents, about 20 miles up from Tikal at the lower end of Woods Canyon. Now we seem to have been a good-natured lot. We read a lot by candlelight, and we also had a lot of good-natured, rousing arguments. Some of us were extremely radical, bordering almost on communism. Some of us advocated such things as labor unions, the eight-hour day, the graduated income tax, workmen's compensation, and the direct primary. I do not recall that anyone had the temerity to suggest such wild things, such as social security, employment security, paid vacations, or public welfare. There was only one strike along the railroad route. It seems the workers had run short on one of the two essentials, snooze. Haney immediately understood the danger and rushed a whole freight car loaded with the snooze to the scene. Keeping the men supplied meant providing them with food, snooze, powder, snooze, drill steel, snooze, shovels, and other hand tools, and snooze. The construction of the railroad through Woods Canyon was a battle against strong winds, heavy snow, and earth slides. This section of the railroad required trestles and tunnels, but plenty of rock work along the slopes supporting the railroad. Faces of mountains and canyons were simply blown away by dynamite. One charge alone consisted of 1,000 cakes of black powder and 35 cases of dynamite. The Mar 132 Bridge, located near the railroad junction and supply station town of Chitna, spanned a length greater than 2,000 feet, making it the longest single bridge constructed on this particular railway. Although a steel bridge was initially planned, Haney instead requested a temporary wooden trestle that would be destroyed annually during spring breakup and then rebuilt. It was the most dangerous bridge along the route. At least 15 lives were lost because of it. One time the bridge collapsed while a crew was repairing it. Five men died. Once the railway men crossed the Chitna, they knew the finish line was within reach. All that awaited them was more than 60 miles of wilderness and the giant Cuscalana Gorge.
The bridge over the Cuscalana River Gorge was an engineering feat that rivaled the million dollar bridge in complexity and difficulty. Workers had to endure temperatures that dropped to 67 degrees below zero. Blizzards raged while they worked and acetylene lights were installed to allow work during the long winter darkness. The Cuscalana Bridge was built in three sections. Two 160-foot anchor spans on either side of the bridge and one 225-foot span that spread across the gorge to cantilever between the two anchor spans. The four supports that held it in place were a concrete pier and steel tower at either end. Work was carried out simultaneously from opposite ends of the bridge. It was completed in two months on New Year's Day 1911. The impossible had again been accomplished, and in record time. The next major structure that was erected on the railway was a wooden trestle at mile 160 across the Gillahina River. It was 880 feet long and 90 feet above the river. It was the largest wooden trestle between Chitna and Bonanza and was erected in the dead of winter. At times, bolts split the timber. The Gillahina trestle was completed in only eight days and the first trains ran across it on January 28, 1911. We had villages at Haley Creek, Ascalita Creek, Terrell, O'Brien Creek, and one at the bridge of the Copper River now called Escalita Camp. One out at Strona and one at Five Mile where the airport is. Almost all of them are right at the mouth of the Copper River. Why? Because that's where the fresh water comes in at and that's where the growth of the plants are and where the game come to the same area. So we did use that as an importance to our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And it was our way of traveling mm -hmm. on the Copper River. Chitna was transformed into a railway town. From 1910 to 1938, Chitna became a way station. It was used as a hub for mining and trading in the Wrangell Mountains and the Chitna Valley. At one point, Chitna was home to 171 people. It had everything you needed. Saloons, clinics, general stores, jails, and of course, a wide selection of characters. The railway brought the first tourists into the region. Visitors would take the train to Chitna and then hop aboard the Ore Company's horse-drawn stage or a touring car to journey to Fairbanks. The visitors stopped at roadhouses along the way. The Chitna Hotel housed many railroad workers. Once the railroad was built, Chitna became the halfway stop between Cordova and McCarthy. Margaret Breedman came to Alaska for adventure and work. She worked as a teacher in Cordova before marrying and moving to Chitna. Here she encountered a number of interesting characters. There was a tale of an old trapper out in the wild who broke the lower half of his false teeth. There was no way of getting them fixed except by his own invention. It happened that a half-grown bear came near enough for him to shoot. He extracted the bear's teeth and melted them in an aluminum kettle, fitting it to his jaw for a plate. He then set the bear's teeth in place and filed them down to fit his mouth. The story is, he then ate the bear. Otto A. Nelson gave up teaching in Missouri and came to Alaska to take up railroading in 1908, later becoming a leading resident of Chitna. He built and owned many structures in Chitna. One such building was the famous garage that he painted ghosts on to signify that Chitna was no longer a tourist trap, but a ghost town.
On the morning of August 24th, 1909, the steamship Ohio sailed from Seattle with railroad supplies, 35 horses, and Big Mike Haney. Haney never trusted the sea, but his work in Alaska forced him to make numerous ocean trips to pick up and deliver supplies. Little did the passengers know that their ordinary trip would take a tragic turn. After midnight on August 27th, 1909, while Haney was talking with the captain, there was a sharp jolt. The ship hit an uncharted rock. Haney sprung into action as the ship began to slowly sink. He assisted the crew in waking the passengers and helped them get to the safety of the lifeboats. He then went below deck to free his horses so they could swim ashore. None of the horses survived. Haney returned to the deck only to find that all the lifeboats were gone. Suddenly there was a huge jolt and Mike was thrown into the water. His clothes weighed him down and he began to sink. A hand reached down and grabbed his collar. Haney refused to get into the lifeboat for fear of swamping it. A while later, he was pulled to shore. After the accident, Haney became very ill, and he grudgingly admitted it. He called his lawyers and had them prepare his will, where he left a generous amount of money to his mother, brothers, sister, lieutenants, friends, and also to the Catholic Church and other religious denominations. In October 1910, a week before his 46th birthday, Michael James Haney died in San Francisco of pulmonary tuberculosis. He was buried in Cavalry Cemetery in Seattle, where over 1,000 people attended his funeral services. Hawkins received the news of Big Mike's death. He staggered away from the phone and walked outside with tears streaming down his face in disbelief. Although Haney was not there to help finish the railroad, he was there in spirit. Big Mike's workers were devastated by the news of his death. They continued to work hard to finish the job for the boss. On Wednesday, March 29, 1911, at 3.30 p.m., the final ceremony took place. The Copper River and Northwestern Railway was complete. It was a joyful day for everyone, but yet it was bittersweet. Standing by was Mike Haney's first engine, old number 50. Hanging on wherever they could were many of Haney's workers. On the front hung a large portrait of their beloved boss. Joe Redman, chief blacksmith for the contractor, fashioned a copper spike that was driven at the end of the road by General Manager Hawkins of the Catala Company and General Superintendent Samuel Murchison of the contracting company. It was cut from a solid piece of native copper taken from the bed of Chittadu Creek, a stream near the Bonanza Mine. The spike was afterward drawn and will be properly inscribed and sent by Mr. Hawkins to the head office in New York as the first return received from an investment of over $40 million. On April 8, 1911, the first train reached Cordova with 35 cars and 1,200 tons of copper ore, valued at $250,000. The whole town of Cordova gathered to celebrate Copper Day and to escort the train to the dock. Michael Haney's and E.C. Hawkins' dream of building an impossible railroad through the challenging country of the Copper River was now a reality. The railroad had taken nearly five years to build. It required some 6,000 workers and $23.5 million, about $1.5 billion in today's dollars. E.C. Hawkins was on top of the world, but almost one year later, he too would die in a Manhattan hospital from complications caused by kidney stones.
while workers raced to complete the Copper River and Northwestern Railway. The syndicate and a few high-placed political officials set their sights on the Bering River coal tracks that had been withdrawn by President Theodore Roosevelt, which required the syndicate to import coal from Canada. In May of 1911, a group of Cordova citizens attacked a steamship loaded with Canadian coal and shoveled it into the harbor, modeling their protest on the famous Boston Tea Party. President Howard Taft's Secretary of the Interior, Richard Ballinger, attempted to open the Bering River tracks. But this action angered the prominent conservationist, Gifford Pinchot, the nation's chief forester. Pinchot accused Ballinger of conspiring with the syndicate to steal Alaska's wealth. Pinchot was fired, which angered Roosevelt so much that he challenged his old friend Taft in the 1912 election by starting his own Bull Moose Party. The rift divided the Republican vote, which delivered the election to Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson went on to create a whole new political entity, a government-funded railroad, the Alaska Railroad, partly to counterbalance the syndicate's hold on Alaska. The U.S. government purchased the Alaska Central Railroad and extended it all the way to Fairbanks at the cost of $35 million. The railroad was completed in 1923, and President Warren G. Harding received the honor of driving in the final golden spike in Nenana. The photo uh, with the gigantic rock sitting on the track, this is a maintenance problem, not a construction problem. And the rock has obviously rolled down the hill uh, somewhere in Wood Canyon or just above Wood Canyon and landed on the tracks. Uh, what they're doing is you see two guys standing on top of the rock swinging sledgehammers, double jacks, at a drill which one guy is sitting on the rock holding in his hands. And every time they hit it twice with the uh, double jack or perhaps even once with the double jack he turns the drill you know like a third of a turn or a quarter turn and he drills a hole in the rock sufficiently deep uh, in order to be filled with black powder and then they can put a fuse in it and blow the rock up into smaller pieces and move it off the track. Once as a train was crossing the Allen Glacier a slump was noticed on the tracks. Maintenance crews worked frantically to fix it hauling gravel from a nearby pit. The train was delayed for two days and passengers were brought food from a nearby section house. Passengers on the train soon became irritated. Finally, on the afternoon of the second day, a lady confronted the conductor. Mr. Olson, I have to get to Cordova. Why, what's the hurry? I'm gonna have a baby. My God, lady, don't you know any better than to get on a train in this condition? Well, I'll have you know, Mr. Olson, when I got on this train, I wasn't even pregnant. It ran about three times a week, and it uh, seemed like it was about six, seven hours to Chitna and another three up to Kennecott. You know, it wasn't anything fancy at all. And Chitna, you got a bite to eat. They didn't have any uh, meals or anything else, unless you brought a lunch along, which I didn't do. And it didn't go very fast. I suppose probably 20 miles, 30 miles an hour at the most. Even though work crews celebrated the railroad's completion, their battle against the forces of the copper did not end. Maintenance crews soon realized that efforts to tame the Copper River would be futile. The nickname, Can't Run and Never Will, summed up the experience of maintaining a 197-mile railroad. Track walkers patrolled the tracks, reporting concerns to the maintenance crews. They were stationed in section houses, and they took daily walks along the line, looking for gray changes debris, and washouts. They policed the track usually every day prior to the arrival of any train. They used to ride along and cover quite an area, and in the winter they used to increase the number, and they used to walk with snowshoes from one point to another, and then return the following day 
and by doing so they kept the condition of the track pretty well covered. Some of the problems included drainage ditches that needed to be built where streams and glaciers crossed the tracks. Fires between Kennecott and Chitna also caused much damage to bridges and trestles. In the notes taken by a uh, University of Washington mining engineering professor who was hired uh, the summer of 16 to come to Alaska and look at mining property and he was over it shortly after it had burned and he notes in his notes what had happened and apparently it was a spark from the train. If you have seen these trestles or historic photographs of the trestles, about every 50 feet on these trestles they had little platforms that stuck out with with wooden barrels full of water. The guy in the, in the last car would jump out and throw water on the sparks that came. But even on the uh, Cuscalana, they had barrels on it too. The bridge at mile 132 was built out of wood. Everyone knew it would be swept away each spring due to flooding. Crews became very adept at repairing the structure rapidly. Even with all their skill, 15 lives were still lost on the maintenance of this bridge due to sudden collapses. We didn't see the ice when it finally broke in the river, and we didn't see the railroad bridge go out when it was completely demolished. But these things did happen, and it wasn't long before the river was running and the bridge crew was busy building the new bridge. Maintenance crews maintain snow sheds across the tracks and avalanche zones. Huge rotary snow plows were also used to clear snow from the tracks. During the storms of 1911, the line experienced massive snows of up to 49 feet in some places. The Copper River in Northwestern Railway now holds the world's record for cutting through snowdrifts. Our rotary cuts 14 feet 7 inches and some of the cuts were from 40 to 60 feet in height. We had to put the men on the drifts and cut benches with shovels, throwing it under the hood of the snowplow so the rotary could handle it. One particular year during a particularly bad winter, the area from the Allen Glacial Glacier Terminus to the Teagle River was getting a lot of overflow and they were having a lot of freeze-thaw cycles and these things that we call pineapple expresses now, I suspect, Chinooks. There was a huge amount of overflow ice that built up on the tracks, 15, 18 inches of overflow ice in places, probably over two feet in places. And rotary snow plows really couldn't touch it at all. Pretty much all they could do is dig the tracks out because there was deep snow on top of it and run at it with the rotary and they could get about, oh, 15 or 20 feet if they got their speed up before they would derail the rotary snow plow. And they'd knock some of the ice off and then they would pull by hand the rotary snow plow back again, put it back on the tracks and make another run at it and get another 15 feet. And they were making about a mile and a half a day uh, with a whole crew and a rotary. Uh, so it took them quite a long time to get the whole way to uh, the Tico River. One of the uh, engineers on the project read quotes where he is quoted as saying that the train, the, the rotary derailed over 1,500 times. Melting permafrost underneath the tracks caused a huge problem for maintenance crews. Hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of gravel were used to stabilize the line. Finally, in 1938, faced with skyrocketing maintenance costs and dwindling copper profits, the owners made the decision to close down the railroad. After 27 years, the railroad was still in running condition and had transported almost 600,000 tons of copper ore to Tidewater. The 1930s brought tremendous turmoil and hardship as the Great Depression took hold on America. All across the nation, men were out of work and families were losing their homes. Kennecott was no exception. 
The Great Depression forced copper prices to drop to five cents per pound, and the mine was played out. Operating the mines and railroad was expensive, and many workers and miners were laid off. In 1937, the Kennecott Copper Corporation decided to close the mines the following year. On September 13, 1938, the Copper River and Northwestern Railroad Company applied for a certificate stating abandonment of the railroad line from Cordova to Kennecott. On November 11, 1938, the day of the last trip, workmen drained the pipes from all the section houses, water tanks, and other buildings along the line. Personal items were removed from section houses, but dishes, pots, and pans were left in the hope that one day, people would return to Kennecott when the copper company reopened the mines. Bavarian China still sat on shelves 50 years later, and houses looked as if they were locked and closed for the winter. Many men believe that so much was invested in the railroad and in the operation in the mines that the owners could not afford to simply abandon it. The last train, operated by Sal Reed, started from Kennecott and picked up men as it proceeded south. World War I veteran Billy Williams watched as the last train departed the town. He went home and recalled the events of the railroad. For 30 years, the iron horse crept over the winding rail to carry the copper from Kennecott and haul the sourdough mail. The hand of time and the work of men who came in numerous bands. Who sweat and toil from earth have wrought the wealth of these great lands. It matters not that the end has come to Rex Beach's iron trail. For men with grim tenacity will live on and still prevail to dig from Mother Earth the wealth that still lies hidden there. And on their backs, as years before, their burden they will bear. After Kennecott closed down in 1938, light tram cars operated between Chitna and McCarthy. O.A. Nelson operated the speeders left by the railroad, where he would deliver supplies to the isolated families that lived from the east bank of the Copper River to McCarthy. In 1963, a salvage firm pulled the last rails from the right-of-way, intending to ship them to a Japanese steel mill. However, the rails arrived in Valdez just in time for the 1964 earthquake and were dumped into the ocean. The 1964 earthquake damaged many of the route's bridges and led to the collapse of the northernmost span of the Million Dollar Bridge that was repaired by state workers in 2005. In the 1970s, the Sierra Club and the Alaska Conservation Society effectively halted attempts to turn the entire railway route into a highway. After the Kennecott mine closed, the populations of McCarthy, Strelna, and Chitna declined rapidly. Gold mining was still lucrative, but copper mining was effectively finished. Many thought that Cordova would become a ghost town when the mines closed, but the town developed a successful fishing and canning industry. Mike Haney would live on in Rex Beach's Iron Trail. Rex Beach was an American playwright, novelist, and Olympic water polo player. Beach spent a summer along the railroad and in 1912 published the Iron Trail. Michael Haney prototype Murray O'Neill carries on a fictional romance with a beautiful red-haired lady known as Eliza Appleton. In one memorable scene from the book, Eliza rushes out across the Million Dollar Bridge where O'Neill waits to see if the bridge will withstand an iceberg barrage. Eliza looked up to find O'Neill, regarding her with an expression that set her heart throbbing and her thoughts scattering. The bridge, the river, the valley itself were gyrating slowly, dizzily. Why did you come to me? Why did you do this thing? I'm such an old, poor thing, and yet, why did you come? She tried to answer, but her lips were soundless. He stared into the colorless face, upturned to his until their eyelids fluttered open, and she managed to voice the words that clung in her throat. 
I've always loved you like this. The Iron Trail was later made into a movie that was directed by Roy William Neal and released by United Artists in 1921. Alma Tell starred as Eliza Appleton and Windham Standing starred as Haney's character, O'Neill. In 1991, Governor Walter J. Hickel, a man who adopted Haney's no-nonsense approach to development, decided to use state bulldozers to clear the route to Cordoba. Governor Hickel was not a firm believer in permits or asking permission. He simply ordered the bulldozers to clear a road to Cordova. Hickel, who was fond of saying that big projects define a civilization, made it all the way to Uranatina River, defying an Army Corps of Engineers order to stop, and claims that he had violated the Clean Water Act. His bulldozers ceased only when the money ran out. After the heavy rains of 2000, the Alaska Department of Transportation announced it would no longer maintain the road, but scores of dipnetters armed with primitive tools struggled to keep the trail along Woods Canyon open after rock and debris slides covered the trail. The old Chitna to McCarthy Railway route has been turned into a road that provides access to Kennecott and McCarthy where thousands of tourists visit each year to indulge in the many recreational opportunities the area offers, or to tour the old Kennecott buildings. In August 2011, the Department of Transportation announced that it was closing the Copper River Highway at mile 36 as a result of bridge and road damage caused by high water. For more than 30 years, the Copper River and Northwestern Railway played an important part in the lives of the people in the Copper Basin. Its impact stretched across Alaska and even into the highest reaches of the U.S. government. Now all that is left are the ruins of a bygone era. You can still see the tracks, the bridges, and the trestles. You might come across an old walker shack or pieces from a railway car, but one legacy will always endure. It was Mike Haney's belief, some might say his religion, that with enough dynamite snooze, gumption, and innovation, there wasn't any obstacle too big or too challenging to stand in the way of his passion.
A sawmill was operated, but it stopped after a forest reserve was established. <laughs> that was a good one too. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly heard that. Go. When I reached Cordova, the town was all over. <laughs> <laughs> I reached Cordova, the town was history, and that's it. Okay. All right. It was gone. Where'd it go? <laughs> so ends our documentary. The only the signs of business is the round camp work. I know, I, I just, just say it yeah. Slower, dude. That's the only signs of business is... Okay, okay, okay I got this, I got this. Shh, shh, shh. Okay, go We also had a lot of good-natured, rousing arguments. Some of us were waiting for Mrs. Knutson. <laughs> Some of us advocated such things as labor unions, the eight-hour day, the graduated income tax, and the direct primary. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dude, All right. Hey, was good, I, I feel your pain, brother. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. uh -oh. <laughs> See, that's the problem with this gun. I have to go get a little screwdriver. to write along with the cover and cover. <laughs> <laughs> they were at work at seven in the morning in every... <clears throat> they were at work at seven in the morning in every kind of weather. And there was no stopping until noon. The copper smike. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, here we go. Copper smike. <laughs> okay. Poor score in seven years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, hold on, I gotta quit laughing. Alright, you ready? She, she told me that she loved me, <laughs> like a fool I believed her from the start. Okay, well, is that getting in the way of that? Nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and that ready? Courage, immigration, to the territory. Oh! The snow on the can, oh, woo! Drawing them that they were outstretched on the river. Oh, okay, I'm gonna try this again. I want more emphasis. Okay, let's hear emphasis. It again. Right, good. Okay. This is our narrator, yeah. and I'm Alan, and we just make a wonderful team. Yeah. We actually, just like sit down here and be like, <laughs> no, dude, just gonna hop on. Hello, city of China. Okay, Thank you. Do that again. No! <laughs> <laughs> it's a bonanza! Like, <laughs> When they reached the Copper River, below modern day Copper Center, most left. Yet many spread out through the country looking for mineral wealth and stuff like that. In 1898. Wait, you're talking really loud. That's okay, but not that loud. Okay, In 1898! <laughs> Let's go, we got other Let's people. have fun! <laughs> yeah! Oh my god! Yeah, Sam, you haven't missed anything, dude. <laughs> Alright, let's go, Dirk. Shh, tell him to be quiet. Quiet on set! Who is that? I can hear him. It was Jake. Who else would it be, Mr. Foley, really? Besides me. Shut up over there! Jake, be quiet! We're filming! He's up the Get enough hunting and fishing. 
He's short enough. Yeah, I know. I, I'm too short anyway. Well, we don't have to see the yeah, Don't show his legs. Jerky. Jerky. Perfect time. Go like out, off to the side and then come into the film no. across yeah. the screen. Or jerky because we're that you're that you're walking. That you're walking and you're getting shot. <laughs> oh, there it was on there. Now it's on. Okay. There was only Wesley. Wesley, stop it. Stop. Okay. River and Northwestern Railroad Company applied for a certificate to abandon the railroad line from Cordova to Kennecott. Giggity, giggity! These two like rocked it. Okay, alright. Just lighten up. We're, we're, we're with you. see Hawkins' son Mason had to walk eight miles. Alright, get in the zone, man! Are we good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. The nickname, Can't Run and Never Will, summed up the experience of maintaining a 170 mile railroad. It's 197. Ah, oh, 107. <laughs> oh, the numbers, man, they're killing it. They're in my brain, you know? <laughs> Cordova offered a good natural harbor. Harbor. The Red Dragon served many purposes and offered a comfortable place to relax. Ah, comfortable place, comfortable, comfortable, com With the rise of with the rise of workers. Oh my God! Numerous op option trips, option trips. That was a good one. The men worked for three dollars and fifty cents for a ten-hour day, when when a dollar seventy-five was a considered a fair wage in the lower forty. Okay. Why don't you say it? Why don't? What's wrong with saying it? I'm retarded. The men worked for three dollars and fifty cents sure, for a ten-hour day. All right, let's do it. Hey, I said it right that time. Yeah. <laughs> no. The men worked. All that is left are the ruins of a bygone era. You can still see the tracks, the bridges, and the trestles. You might come across a big truck or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Should I hold myself this time? Like you're freezing. No. The Copper River was an important. <sighs> okay. <You> ready? <laughs> uh, 911. Could you please rush up to Chitna? Uh, Dirk Rosencrantz said his lines correct the first time. I don't think he's feeling very well. Okay, please, yeah. Uh, it's an emergency! A helicopter. Uh, it's an emergency, a helicopter, please. Yeah, jet quickly. plane, Medivac. jet plane. Jet plane, please. Yeah. He's not feeling well. He's getting his lines Dirk, Dirk, down he'll make it. the first he'll make time. It. Don't go it's in the right. right. I think he's gonna go in a coma. Oh my gosh. Dirk, are you okay? No. Okay. <laughs> The Copper River and Northwestern Railway would stretch almost 200 miles, crossing one of Alaska's most powerful rivers, squeezing its way between two massive glaciers, crossing more than 13 rivers and canyons, and snaking its way through some of Alaska's most rugged mountains. Oh, Mr. Volley, Mr. Volley, I have an idea. And what is that, Mariah, said Mr. Volley with a tired voice. I think we should wrap the copper. It would be great. We could get video and it would be really fun. From his lips came a deep sigh and a drawn out, I don't know, I'll have to think about it. I'll not do it for you, I might do it with you. Yeah, Mr. Foley, please, said the class in unison. Who knew that would be the start of a grand adventure? On June 11, 2011, 11 teenagers were deposited on a sandbar. As the wind and sand forced them to hide their smiles, on the inside, nothing could destroy their exuberant joy. This was the beginning of their seven-day trip down the rugged and wild Copper River. The students of Mr. Volley's documentary class were accompanied by 10 different adults from the National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, 
and the Kenny Lake School on this adventure. Finally, we launched, and we were free. This is until we came upon Woods Canyon, where rock and sand collapsed upon us like skyscrapers in a city. Greywater's history was evident as we saw it split the land. When we stopped for lunch, our faces were already starting to be rubbed raw from the constant wind and sand facial. You were lucky to get a bite of your food without sand slowly grinding down your teeth. It was getting late and started to look like we'd be camping on rocks until our guides pointed out a large beach just behind a hook-shaped chunk of land, which was just enough to cut the wind. Tents needed setting, rafts unloading, kitchen constructing, bathroom and wag bag establishing, and zones determined. Dinner would prove to be a challenge. Who knew making sirloin steak, potatoes, and Greek salad for 21 people would be a challenge? After dinner, there was free time for playing basketball or can jam. But for three unlucky people, it was time to do the dishes. This was not an easy task on the river. You never knew if what you were cleaning was actually clean or not. Days passed and we slipped into river time. As we wound our way down the river, the wind continued to beat our tired bodies. It was becoming harder to find a camping spot. Every turn of the river, the wind got stronger. One night, we were forced to pull out onto a beach. Luckily, we found a clearing in the woods where we could set up camp, but that did not stop the sand from blowing. Just above Abercrombie Rapids, some of the students decided they were tired of being dirty. Intrigued at the thought of how they would get clean, Christy Knudsen and Mariah Doty decided to go down and watch this endeavor. Once the girls got in the river's silt bog, they realized that there was no point in trying to get clean. The water was almost four and a half feet deep and was nothing but silt. So, instead of bathing activity, it turned into a mud party. Christy and Mariah were both drug into the water against their will, and some of the boys attempted cannonballs. And Leah, what would your father think of you right now? My father would think I'm that stupid. I'm stupid. <laughs> My dad would say wow. Yep. And Christy, yes. what would your uh, what would your sisters think of you right now? They would think that I'm awesome. I don't, really <laughs> I don't know. Yes. They would be jealous. And Audrey, what would Keaton think of you right now? Why is he here? Yep. What would your daddy say right now? Um. Wow. You're messy. <laughs> yeah. Clean up before dinner. Right? Yeah. Tessa. Tessa, what would Amanda think right now? Why would she think that? Because she's a baby and she doesn't like cold water. After Tessa Wigand's experience with hypothermia, we decided it would be safer to stay away from water for a while. It started as a challenge from the boatman to race across Miles Lake with two people rowing while collecting the largest chunk of ice. Immediately, high school egos kicked in. As the six rafts raced across Miles Lake, you could hear teams yelling at each other, trying to work together, but failing miserably. When we pulled out for the day, the students were having mixed feelings. We were getting to stay in a campground with an actual outhouse in an enormous glacier. But the raft adventure was over. Never again would we set foot in those rafts. The guys decided to treat us and cook us dinner down by the Million Dollar Bridge. That night, we had steak with potatoes and broccoli, probably the best meal on the trip. As we sat eating our dinner, we saw a particularly strange sight in the water. What is that? Someone yelled. We all hopped up to sea. And there, in the Copper River, right next to Child's Glacier, was a moose, just going for a dip. We stayed our last night of the trip at the Cordova School. It probably took most of the girls a good 20 minutes to get all the silt and mud out of their hair. It was nice to put on clean clothes that had not been stuffed in a dry bag for seven days. Groups were divided up by tents, or at least the boys were. Dirk, Sam, and Wesley kept everyone on the edge of their seats as they performed a montage of musical activities. Go, 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 go
Cody and Mr. Foley created a classic Lean on Me with a few twists. Three. Well, I might have a problem when the whack bag is full. We all need somebody to lean on. So help me, my brother, when the tent is not put up. We all need somebody to lean on. Lean on me. The girls went for a song that fit the festivities perfectly. That night came to a close too fast, but since we needed to board the ferry in the morning, we had no choice. Everything we had experienced over the last seven days had slowly become a memory as we boarded the ferry. But I don't know if anyone could forget the mud children, the dishes, Dirk being kicked off the trip, the tunnel, steal the flag, or the calving glacier. I know for myself, smiles have been etched into my mind. These memories will not fade. They are once in a lifetime remembrances that come along and must be seized or they will pass you by. Everybody following your lead? I mean, oh, I, yeah. I know you're bossing a lot of people around. They, they knew who's boss. Really? Do you want to see something? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. I don't know if you know, but today we decided to vote one member off the trip, and it was you. How do you feel about that? Um, a little bit disappointed, but I mean, yeah. What are you gonna do about? It? Yeah. <laughs> how are the How are the bears gonna treat you? Someone has to go. Yeah. Somebody yeah. has to go. Yeah. No, the bears. Uh, we're we're buds. We're cool. Yeah. Why do you think they voted you off the trip? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Because you were so loud last night. <laughs>
Hi. What you doing, Kristen? We are making a uh, uh, chicken salad uh -huh. for lunch. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I did, yeah. Um, How do you want it? Do I do this Ch bit? Tessa, what do you have against that red onion? <laughs> did it do something to you? I'm trying to chop She's like a chef. Murderalizing. Oh, I think. Murderalizing. Murderalizing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ninjas. I'm are you kidding me? Group. It's early after the first night of our river trip right here. Six boats, which isn't good because there should be seven. Seven boats in our camp. One of our girls, probably Christy, getting up. Yep, that's Audrey. Audrey getting up. Start making. <laughs> this is our narrator, yeah. and I'm Alan, and we just make a wonderful team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so just like sit down here and be like, <laughs> no, did you just <laughs> 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 That's so true. All right, no.